is Jack Owen from Six Feet Under, and you're watching Richard Metal Fan. Hey, what's up, guys? Episode 240 of Richard Metal Fan Interviews, calling from Zoom, and I have the honor and the privilege to speak with the legendary Jack Owen from Six Feet Under, best known as, known as formerly of D Campbell Corpse and Deicide, and probably a plethora of other bands. So how are you doing today, Jack? Good, man. How are you doing? Not too bad, not too bad. Had a long day of work, and I'm here to do an interview with one of my favorite guitarists. Right on. So kind of what I want to do is do like a speed run of your discography, as well as talk about the new Six Feet Under album. But I'm always curious about your musical history. So kind of growing up, what were the first bands that got you into metal, and what made you want to start playing the guitar? Oh, man. Uh, originally, my brother had a copy of Kiss Alive, and it was a, a cassette dub. So I didn't know what they looked like, and I loved the music. <laughs> and my dad had a guitar, an acoustic guitar, and I just grabbed it and messed around with it and broke a bunch of strings and put it back. So he got me my own and taught me some chords, and I was off and running. Wow. Cool. And I guess the one band I want to talk about is, I believe your first band was Beyond Death. I'm always curious about that. Like, nobody ever really talks about Beyond Death. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, that was the very first band. It was like me and Alex were in high school, and so was Darren the drummer. Um, I was jamming with Darren in his basement, just messing around, and I was like, hey, I know a bass player, Alex, and uh, I told Alex, hey, I know a drummer, Darren, so we just started getting together, and I think that was about the time of Master of Puppets. So we actually tried doing some of that, but we ended up doing like Leper Messiah and what else? Uh, Beastie Boys, just any crap that we could figure out. <laughs> and wow. We had to kind of convert Darren because he was a fan of like Van Halen and he had never heard thrash metal. So we converted him over to metal and pretty soon it was like Celtic Frost and all the the regulars exodus and all that shit yeah and i guess like you and alex then formed cannibal corpse in 1988 so so how did, did you how did you get to form the band and how does it feel to be part of like a i guess the a legends in death metal uh it's just an honor uh we were just kids in buffalo and we all had the same interests and uh like me and alex from the country and we got involved in the buffalo scene and Tyrant Sin was the other band that had Paul Mazurkiewicz, Chris Barnes, and Bob Russe. And we all split up at the same time and just got together and started writing. Yeah. And then you started playing locally around New York, and then you got signed to Metal Blade Records. So how did yeah. they find Cannibal Corpse? Oh, Mike Fairley is the vice president over there, and he's from Buffalo. So he signed the Goo Goo Dolls, <laughs> who we did a few shows with back in the day because they were punk rock. Yeah, I still have flyers, and it's like it's Goo Goo Dolls and Cannibal Corpse. That sounds like a weird combination. <laughs> yeah, they were like punk rock, and they ran around barefoot and had spiky hair and shit back then. Still didn't match them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But then tell me about making the first Cannibal Corpse album, Eaten Back to Life. I put it yeah. up there with one of the best debut albums, along with like Don. Dawn of Possession by Immolation, Altars of Madness by Morbid Angel. So what was the thought process going into making the debut Cannibal Corpse album? Um, you can hear a lot of like early Exodus and uh, Sepultura because we were into thrash and, and triplet playing on the guitar and, you know, trying to do stuff like Celtic Frost and Napalm Death and Dark Angel along the way. But yeah, that's so thrashy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, especially I love songs like Scattered Remains, Splattered Brains, Skull Full of Maggots. Like, these are like fucking metal song titles. I know, we were already like brainstorming. We had the big sheet out like they still have in the practice room, like all the titles. It's like we got the titles before we even write any music or lyrics. Yeah. yeah. So when Eaten Back to Life was released, did you like start touring outside of New York for the first time or was it still just kind of local? Pretty local, like downstate New York, upstate New York, and a little Toronto. Uh, nothing major until Butchered at Birth came out. 
you know, which lead me into the next album because usually with the debut album, you have like your entire life to write, and there's a lot of hype with the first album. When it yeah. came to making Butchered at Birth, did you feel pressure to follow up Eaten Back to Life? Mm, not really, because we hadn't toured on it and we went into running for Butchered so fast. Yeah. Because it literally came out like a year after Eaten Back to Life. So I'm guessing you all just like started writing for it right after it came, Eaten Back to Life came out. Yeah. Eaten was five songs from our demo and we filled it up with six or so new new songs and uh i think we were just ready to start writing that like immediately yeah yeah and i still think it's a, another great album a great follow-up up to eating back to life yeah that's probably the most evolution between albums that we had because we started kind of overwriting and everybody was writing tons of shit and uh I think it's the the step to just pure death metal from eaten to butchered. Yeah. And then we get to the masterpiece, Tomb of the Mutilated. Mm. Yep. Classic album. So how do you, how did was the thought process going into making this album? And did you did you feel like you were kind of like on to something making butchered uh, Tomb of the Mutilated? Yeah, um after eaten and butchered, we had done simple thrash and then we did kind of technical for us butchered at birth and then we uh, simplified it a little bit for tomb i think just naturally um we were better players and probably better writers yeah like hammer smashed face i come blood and trail search of a virgin's kind like like i just think it's great even like the album artwork i just the love how somebody even made a meme of the of the this saying like thank god for the parental advisory logo we would never tell that this would be a be inappropriate yeah they did the all white cover with just yeah. the logo <laughs> yeah yeah but tell me because i know with hammer smash face you were also featured in ace ventura pet detective with jim carrey so what was that like like being in the, being in a movie with probably one of the best comedians of all time yeah, we only knew him from In Living Color <laughs> at the time. Yeah. Like, Another great show. Yep, I think we had uh, Airheads or Ace Ventura. And for some reason, we picked that one. I think because they were filming in Miami and it wasn't a bad run to go down there and, and do that. And a club that we had played before in the cameo. So, uh, man, yeah, it was a trip. Because we just go in like at the live show, but it's... You can barely hear the music over the speakers because they're doing dialogue in the crowd and, and whatever. There's a lot of longer cuts that never made the, the movie. Yeah. And I remember like watching like an episode that down downbeat be with uh, Paul and he pretty much said like 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 they moved the schedule like, their filming schedule around because you were like doing a tour at the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He was in like Napalm Death and Deicide and when we met him, he was like more of a fan of us than we were of him <laughs> at the time. <laughs> yeah. It was cool. Yeah. Yeah. And I, yeah, I loved how like your first three albums were like released like a year after year, year, year after each other. Like you just like, were just like on a roll with the first three albums. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I write that much lately, but it's like, you have to approve budgets and everything with labels now. So I could put out an album a year <laughs> with so uh, with the pro prolificity prolificity of my, of my writing. <laughs> uh, this album's done, and I already have pretty much the whole next album written. Yeah, and then talk. Then next up is the bleeding, and hard to believe this year does mark the thirty year anniversary of this album. It's pretty much as old as me. So, so how do you feel about this album now, thirty years later? Love it. I can put that on any time. Like some of them sound a little abrasive and overwritten and we're trying too hard. But the bleeding was like, okay, we know how to play, but can we write songs? So, you know, and the production was a little better on that as well. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Probably my favorite. Yeah, definitely. Like fucked with a knife, stripped, raped, and strangled. These are all just classics that would still remain in the the Cannibal Corpse set list even today, even even after you you left the band. Yeah. I just I don't know. It's just really a great album. Yeah. But then then you started touring, of course, for uh, the Bleeding, and then you started working on Vile. But originally it was called Created to Kill. But then of course Chris Barnes had left, and then you got. George Corpse Grinder Fisher. So, oh, so how did like the dynamic change between working from Chris to George? We weren't sure what to expect with George 
but after listening to what he did with Monstrosity, we figured we could just write anything and and he could do it. When, and we were right. <laughs> yeah. Same with the guys that are in Six Feet Under now. Anything I write, they can play and play it a lot better than I can. So yeah. that's the way George was. Yeah. And did you like feel like nervous, especially with the, the vocalist change? Like you're worried like how fans would react to like a new guy singing? Sure. Yeah. It's a big step. It's like a totally different band. So uh, the label freaked out and we were kind of freaked out, but we just went ahead and did what we had to do. Yeah. Like I pretty much knew, especially hearing the opening track Devoured by Vermin, it was like, yeah, they made the right choice. Yeah, we got the seven string guitars on that one and yeah, everything just went balls out. <laughs> yeah. And then we get to uh, Gallery of Suicide. I like this album. I pretty much one of the most underrated Cannibal Corpse albums. So what was the thought process going into making this album? I love that. Well, we got Pat after Rob split. And yeah. it was another thing like we had two guitar players in mind, one nobody's ever heard of, and, and Pat. And I didn't know how good Pat was at the time until we started writing. And was like, hey, here's a lead spot. See what you can do. And it's just like <laughs> shredded it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, he helped with crafting the sound of the band because we were at seven string guitars and different tunings. And at that point in our musical career, it was just like, we can do anything, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, especially with Pat's addition to the band, of course, now currently killing it with Exhorter. I think he definitely adds like another level into Cannibal Corpse's sound. Yeah, like stuff like the title track is just like full like black metal minor chords that, that I wrote. <laughs> it's like, I'll try it out, see what happens. Yeah. <laughs> then we get to uh, the Bloodthirst. And hard to believe this year does mark the 25th anniversary of this album. Like, I love this album, especially one of my favorite songs is The Spine Splitter. Tell me about like <laughs> this album. Yep. That's like more progression into playing like insane shit. It was like the whole middle part is just like tapping. And it was like, here, Alex, let's see if you can play this. And of course, he has no problem playing anything that, that I write or, or try to play. Yeah. More evolution in our playing for sure. Yeah. And yeah. I I... George can do anything. We started writing lyrics that we, no, dude, there's no way he can sing that. But of course, he did it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Can't go wrong there. Nope. And, and then we get to uh Gore Obsessed. I love this album. Like That's nobody it, with all, all the Cannibal Corpse albums, like nobody ever really talks about this one. I like it. What are a couple tunes off of there? I just listened to it on vinyl a little while ago. There's like Savage Butchery, Hatch oh. to the Head, Pit of Zombies, Dormant Bodying Bursting. Like yeah. this whole album is like a banger from start to finish. Well, it's really intense. So, yeah, we ramped up the speed on that one and yeah, it's kind of like there's so many albums. It's like you got to put some to the back shelf, I guess. <laughs> but I don't. I love that one. <laughs> yeah. And then, of course, your last album with Cannibal Corpse, The Wretched Spawn. And this year marks the 20-year anniversary of that. I know there's a lot of album anniversaries this oh, yeah, year. But, but tell me about making this this album. What were sort of your memories making this? Who produced that? Was that the Colin Richardson one? or was I, th he I think it is, yeah. Yeah, yeah, Colin Richardson, yeah. killer metal producer. Mm -hmm. So so how was it like making this album? That's really cool because we had settled in at the Sonic Ranch in El Paso by then because we did our second or third album there. And it's like a hacienda with a studio. It's like so comfortable to stay there and record, just walk across the courtyard and, and record. Super comfortable. Had everything written pretty quick as far as I can remember. Yeah. And th then then you started touring a little bit. And how hard was it to leave Cannibal Corpse at the time? Because you, you pretty much started the band. Uh, yeah, it was difficult because it was... I didn't know that each guy was going to call me and make sure that that was what I wanted to do. And I was like, yeah, I think it's time to move on. Yeah, uh, because... Yeah, because I know you also had that, that band Adrift you were doing at the same time. Yeah, that was like really nothing. That was like something to do in the background. Yeah. But it was like, eh, man, the grind was 
like after that many albums just it was tour write record repeat <laughs> yeah no but, time at home at all yeah but it, during the same year in 2004 you actually ended up joining deicide so how'd you hook up with glenn benton and the boys uh, they were at the airport in Tampa and the Hoffman brothers didn't show up. So it was literally, what are you doing? And I'm like, nothing. And how fast can you learn our set? And I'm like, well, I know most of it in my head cause I'm a fan. So it was like, all right, when are you leaving tomorrow? <laughs> and, uh, it's pretty quick to get over there and, you know, the, it was kind of an emergency for them and I wasn't doing anything. I still had the practice room. So, and then I just went up to their rehearsal space and jammed out with them and then flew to Europe. And then Dave Suzuki flew in like a couple of days. Later. He learned everything on the airplane. Yeah. Yeah. And talk about making your first record with DSI, the stench of redemption. I thought it's a different album compared to what I've heard from like Legion, Jin, scars of the crucifix once upon a cross so what was the thought process going into making this album that was definitely redemption for glenn so he was like uh he knew ralph and i was like i he's a buddy of mine i can call him up and he can do all the leads on it because we had everything written uh rhythm wise steve actually gave me a vhs tape of him playing all the riffs on an acoustic guitar and somehow I just finagled it all into like a song at a time. And sometimes we would, me and Steve would put together like two songs a day. So we had that written in like three, three, four weeks. And then just went into more sounds. I, I did all the rhythm guitars. I think so. Maybe Steve played some rhythm guitar and Ralph played the leads. Ralph played some rhythm guitar on that, I think. And it was really good. Yeah. Yeah, and, yeah, like homage for Satan, death to Jesus, desecration. Like, ugh, this is like even next level than Cannibal. Yeah, um, some people aren't fans of the post Legion DSI, but I think it's pretty good. Yeah, and was it like working with the late great Ralph Santola? Do you have like great certain me special memories with him? Oh yeah, awesome! It was like every show, just we would get there and head to the bar in town and have a few beers and go back for sound check and then go get food and a couple more beers <laughs> and then do the show. That was like our daily routine. Not like we were getting wasted or anything, but it was like we were brothers. It was like we loved to travel. We loved to play. We just liked the same things. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And so, so what were you, were you kind of like ner nervous at, nervous at all as being at this was like your first record with DSide? Hmm. Kind of, because, you know, I would think they would want to write stuff that maybe was like the first two albums, but Steve wrote all the riffs, so, and that's the way they were. And they're pretty melodic, but it's heavy, it's blasty, and I think it stood the test of time so far. Yeah. Then we get to Till Death Do Us Part. Part. And I know last year was the 15 year anniversary of this. So, so being as this was the second album you did with DSI, did you feel like more comfortable now? And did you like contribute more than what you did on Central Redemption? Um, yeah, but that album, Steve did the drums and they did all the rhythm guitar. And I played three or four solos and Ralph did the rest of the lead. So that's really Steve's album. <laughs> oh, really? I didn't even know he played guitar. I, yeah, I thought he was not the drummer. Drums, guitar, and he's an awesome classical piano player. <laughs> oh wow! Holy shit! I need I need to have him on here. Here, I gotta ask him about about all like the, playing all those instruments. Yeah, I'm not sure what he's best at. Maybe the piano, because he is deep into classical. Like you could trivia him on classical shit. Yeah, and I remember hearing like a quote, uh, like like a like a meme. Somebody said is like, he "Heavy metal is just classical music before electricity." Yeah, yeah. I yeah. mean, everything goes back to like uh, two people, like Hank Williams Sr. and uh, Robert Johnson, pretty much, and everything evolved from there as far as modern music. Yeah.
And I love blues, blues, country, and then rock. And who was metal first? Cream, Black Sabbath. I don't know. Who cares? <laughs> <laughs> Good point. And I love like the album artwork. You pretty much used the pa painting "Woman and Death" from fifteen eighteen fifteen twenty by Hans Baldung. So, how, what inspired you to use this little piece of art for the album? That's pretty awesome cover. Some people don't like it, but I don't know how he got licensing for it, but it's killer. Oh, perfect. yeah. Perfect for the title and everything. And he yeah. was going through his divorce at the time. Nice. And then we get to To Hell With God, probably much the uh, the best album artwork I've seen. So how, yeah. tell me about making this album. Man, um, writing it was a little painstaking. Uh, Steve had most of the music written. I think I wrote two or three songs on there. As we were at the end and we needed songs, so I think I wrote Angels of Hell and or is that on the next album? Yeah. I think, yeah, I think it is. Angels of Hell, I think is No, I know it is, yeah. It is on this. Yeah, that's that was my Slayer song for that album. <clears throat> um, I don't know. It's like I'm not sure how it was received because it was like, oh the title is like striper or something. <laughs> and it was like this album is a sellout, and it's like it's the fastest deicide album there is. I think I I remember playing so fast on every song, and I was like, when it came out, sellout. I'm like what? <laughs> That's like the dumbest shit I've ever heard. <laughs> <laughs> so weird. Yeah, but I know also the same year, 2011, you did the Grave Descent, the self-titled titled yeah. little EP. So tell mm -hmm. me about like that. That was like tell me about that, and how'd you hook up with those guys? Yeah, I moved back to Buffalo because my father passed away, so I took over his estate, and I knew Dennis, the singer, and he had a band, and oh, we would always, like, contact through eBay, I think, or email or whatever, and I was like, yeah, let's put some stuff together. Mike Green, the other guitar player, was in Leviathan. It was Chris Barnes. He wrote everything on that. I wish I had, like, more of an output uh, as far as writing back then. I do now, but... Back then, it was like Mike wrote everything, and it was good players. The drummer was great. Uh, oh, the bass player was awesome. He was in Tyrant Sin with uh, Chris and Paul Mazurkiewicz. Cool. Well, and then, of course, your last album with Deicide and the Minds of Evil. I thought this was a pretty good album. Of course, you're working with Kevin Corey, Ian, who replaced Ralph. So, what was that like working with him? And what was the, awesome. the great pop, great like working with this album? Kevin's awesome. He's like a guy that would do anything for you. And he's so motivated as far as writing and contributing and helping out on the road with anything. It's like Ray in Six Feet Under is our uh, Kevin. <laughs> like the guy that would do anything for you. He'll wow. drive, drive the whole tour and then play and then load everything and then load it out at the end of the night and then serve drinks. <laughs> but uh, yeah, Kevin is awesome he wrote killer stuff on there very thrashy uh but me and him worked well together there's a lot of like co-writing on there between me and him yeah yeah then of course you eventually left the in 2016 so how hard was it to leave the oh it was like a, a problem with like new stuff i was writing and they uh i walked into practice and steve had redone it re-recorded it and changed like notes here and there for like three or four songs that i had it was stupid at the time but he's like hey i changed the notes so i get writing credit and and i'm like that's not how the songs go though and glenn's like it is now <laughs> so i literally walked out and ghosted him <laughs> and then wow. later on i was like hey dude you're out <laughs> wow and then I know after that you was uh, Devil's Highway, which I'm always curious because I know it was like you, Ralph, Steve DiGiorgio, you know, and I think uh -huh. Kyle from Exhorter. So what was what was that like? Because nobody ever talks about that. Yeah, it was like uh, Kyle wasn't in Tampa very often, but you know me, me and Ralph were obviously there. Tony Loriano was he toured a lot with like whoever back then. But when he was around, we put stuff together, and it was, I don't know, it had like a, a Cajun feel to it, like a, a down or something, I guess, because maybe we were writing around Kyle. Um, 
and I don't know how many songs we wrote, maybe like five. And uh, Ralph kind of finished them up on his own, and they weren't totally done, but I think they're floating around somewhere. Yeah. Yeah, I still think it's a really, really good. Like, you have, like, all these bands, whether it be with Cannibal, DSI, Six Feet Under, Spur, and, of course, next up, it's Sir, Vince Wister. Spur. So how different of a mind frame is it, depending on the projects that you're on? Do you have to, like, maybe adjust your playing depending on the project? Or are you allowed to, like, have, like, free reign and bring, like, your own sort of, like, style within any of the bands that you've been involved with? Yeah, it's usually, like, free reign. My, like, if I have a method to record it and present it, um i just do a million ideas and you like this and don't like that okay we're going in that direction <laughs> nice and then of course i want to talk about the divine Ma manipulation single from serpent's whisper in 2017 so tell me about like that because i was like listening to it in preparation for this interview it's just a kick-ass song so tell me about that well i didn't record on it or write it it was just kind of like an idea of a band um I think Damien wrote that. Oh, he plays guitar. So he tracked all that with uh, Ricky, who's now singing for Suffocation. So it's it's dead, pretty much, unless they keep going. I don't know what they're going to do with it. Yeah. And then that, that same year, you joined up Six Feet Under. So how did you end up joining the band? I had talked to Chris, like, you know, over the years, since he's been out of Cannibal and and I have, and uh, I noticed they had one guitar player, and everything sounds better with two. And I was like, dude, you need a guitar player for the upcoming tour? And he's like, sure. So that was pretty much it. I mean, I started learning songs that they don't even play. And he's like, dude, you only got to learn like 15 songs. <laughs> I was like learning like the whole discography. <laughs> <laughs> Hoping they would play like songs that, that I liked from their discography but they already had a set list and yeah. like yeah let's go yeah and tell me about making your first the first record with with the band nightmares of the decomposed of course it was released in 2020 you know the certain virus that shall not be named happened did like yeah. the pandemic at all sort of like influence the sound of the album maybe sonically maybe the sound yeah, because everything was written in 2019 2018 and 2019 and i just got back from Orlando doing the guitars in March of 2020 <laughs> before everything shit the fan. But uh, everything had been written. Um, I really didn't have like a, the method that I have now of writing. I, I don't think I even had a multi-track. I didn't have a drum writing program. Uh, I had an archive of riffs, but I had no way to put them together because Marco's in Seattle. <laughs> so uh, it could be a lot better on my part musically. Yeah. Yeah. And I thought it was a pretty, pretty good album. One of my favorites from that year with like Zodiac, The Rotting, being like pretty sick songs. Yeah. There's a couple good ones on there. Yeah. But I was working with like drum loops and writing off the top of my head, even though I had, I have a huge riff archive of like MP3s of riffs. Yeah. And uh, I don't know. I really just kept writing off the top of my head. <laughs> Yeah. Which was kind of dumb on my part. Because now I have a way to write and a way to record it, demo it, and that's it. Yeah. And then of course in 2022 you joined up with Empty Throne. So tell me about like that project. Yeah, I'm not sure what's going on with that either. It's uh I think it's a little uh out of touch on my part because I've been so busy with six feet under. I wasn't able to, you know, track what they're doing for an LP re-release. So, uh, I don't know. I'd have to touch base and see what's up with that. I, I have material written for it, but I'm not sure. I, I've been so out of touch with them. Yeah. But now we have, like, the new Six Feet Under album, Killing for Revenge, coming out May 10th. 10th. So, what was the writing and recording process like for the new album? Writing was, like I said, I have formulas now. I, I never run out of riffs. I have the drum program, anything that's in my head. It's like turn on the laptop and write all the drums and lay them down and then lay down guitar and bass. And I even do vocals for like, a, you know, just a scratch track of vocal for Chris. So he knows where the lyrics go. So uh, 
I pretty much have the perfect setup and technique for writing song after song. <laughs> That's yeah. why I said I got the whole next album written. Yeah. And musically, did you want to continue in the same vein as Nightmares of the Decomposer? Did you want to try something different that Six Feet Under hasn't done before? Um, it's definitely like what me and Chris would write in Cannibal. Um, it's like all my influences from back then. I, I still listen to them. Like Celtic Frost, I don't it sound like that. But, you know, early Exodus, Destruction, Creator, Dark Angel, all that stuff. I still listen to it. I never put the LPs away and they're still doing stuff. So you can hear it. And it's like me and Chris. Pretty yeah. Much wrote everything so it was like hey it sounds like cannibal <laughs> like the yeah. last song was uh when the moon goes down in blood and chris was like hey let's do something like off a of butcher to birth and i put the album on and i think the song living dissection was playing and i was like hey that's cool something like that and i really just needed the beat that paul mazurkowitz would play he just played colin berserk because he that's his main thrash beat is just like kind of out of control snare first blast beat kind of thrash beat really yeah yeah and of yeah, course and still inspiration from that album and then it was like moon goes down in blood boom <laughs> yeah and of course six feet under has now been around for 30 years and you've pretty much made uh, made like death metal history with six feet under and of course with cannibal corpse and deicide what do you like personally about six feet under Man, uh, everybody gets along like brothers. Uh, like I was saying, Ray is like Kevin uh, Curion from DSI, the guy that would do anything for you. He's an amazing guitar player. He can play anything. Like, we don't even rehearse before we go on tour because we can't because we're all over the country. And what we do is go to the first gig and hang it out in the dressing room and play the whole set, like, acoustically. And Marco's banging on the table with his sticks <laughs> it's like jeff and marco and ray they can play anything it's like i'm not worried about writing anything too technical or if we want to cover something live and they're super cool they're like brothers to me so yeah it's a perfect situation yeah yeah well, well with the last album nightmares of the decompose i feel like six feet under is a special band which chris barnes sort of like the head honcho virus the rest of the guys sort of like like write on a regular basis which i pretty much can hear on like some of the other albums how did it work out this time with the, the new album and did you write write some songs on this album on killing for revenge yeah yeah i did all the music and then i wrote like a lot of the lyrics <laughs> that's why i was saying it was like i had a for accomplice to evil deeds that song that came to me in a dream it was me and Corpse Grinder, and we were in a shack in the woods, and he was killing people, and I was his accomplice. And I was like, I woke up, and I was like, wow, that's a song. It's like, boom. So I had the lyrics written kind of before the music. So I laid everything down on my multi-track. Like, hey, let me put the lyrics on here for Chris with my best death metal vocals. And I sent that to him, and he was like, awesome. And or lyrics and he's like dude do that for every song <laughs> so it was like most of the, the lyrics or the patterns uh i came up with uh when i was writing the music yeah and when you joined up with six feet under were there sort of like any like rules from chris to how like the band should sound or when you sort of like joined did you add sort of like your own like style into six feet under uh yeah i try to write stuff like haunted or, or sound like obituary so yeah My yeah that sucks. yeah but we're, <laughs> we're almost done and kind of like talking about like the live live show like how different of a mind frame is it to playing live as to recording is there any differences or similarities between the two totally separate um studio is uh controlled uh you get a second, third, ten, tenth chance to do everything. So there's that. And live is just off the cuff. And whatever feels good or sounds good at the moment. All right. All right. And and sort of like in the end to wrap things up, what's next for, with, for Six Feet Under? Have you all have, have any tours lined up? 
Mm, there's a couple things being tossed around, but nothing's confirmed yet. Um, I'm sure there will be a promo blitz if something comes out. Um, we're throwing around another Graveyard Classics or another original album, depending on what the label wants to do, I guess. Yeah. yeah. So we'll be busy. We're going to pick up some touring when the album comes out. Yeah, and I'm looking forward to it. So uh, thank you, Jack, for this conversation. It's cool. great to have six, have six Feet Under on my show. It's just anything thing else you want to say to the viewers that are watching this to close this out? Just thank you for the decades and decades of support. <laughs> that was a, a walk down memory lane with all the albums. Oh, From yeah. 1989, 1990 <laughs> till now. That's crazy. Uh, yeah. I think we'll be doing this for like 50 years pretty soon. Crazy. Oh, yeah. So everybody, Jack Owen from Six Feet Under. See you next time.